Welcome everyone to Witness Underground podcast number 14. Today we have as guests Ryan and Chad from the Nuclear Gopher Project and the Witness Underground movie. Guys, introduce yourselves more fully. I'm Ryan. Yeah, I am the OG of Nuclear Gopher. At least the last one is still around and kicking. And uh, if you saw the movie, you saw me in it. And if you saw the other 13 podcasts, you probably saw me in that too. It's underground.com for the trailer. And I'm Chadley. Um, I am the uh, original fanboy in that uh, right toward the beginning of uh, Nuclear Gopher's inception. Um, I was the guy who was like, can I watch you guys play music? And then later they were like, do you want to play music with us? And um, I died a little bit that day and was reborn. My first baptism. I don't know. Grew a tail like a true gopher. That's all I got. So I have a couple of quick things to update to um, get us going, and then we can dive in. Um, there's an episode that just came out, episode 13. That's what I said this was. This is episode 14. Episode 13 uh, features Yatri Soul, who's an old friend of mine. She was a missionary in Ecuador. We were friends when we were both missionaries down there. She was a need grader. Actually, yeah, new, legit need grader, and I was like hacking it. Anyway, that episode Can you, can you explain to it? Sorry, can you explain what need grader is? Because even oh, yeah. growing up as a witness, I don't necessarily even always know what that is. A missionary is different than a need grader. A missionary is someone who's sent by the organization to go to a foreign country that the organization chooses. So they'll send you, the, you go to Gilead school and they like send you somewhere that they think needs help. And then you're like, have to like carve out a congregation from the local populace. A need grader mm-hmm. is someone who is also approved, not sent by, but approved by your local congregation and approved by a branch in a certain country, wherever you want to go. And you sort of just like join the congregation and assist them in their outreach. Um, And they're just knocking on doors full time, doing nothing else, no work in that particular country. And you fund your own way or you get your local congregation or family or friends to fund your life and flights and housing and all that stuff. The term coming from you going where the need is greater, right? That's nice. yeah, exactly. Yeah, the need is great. And nice. yeah, so she was down in Ecuador when she, she was like 19 to 22. And I met her, I think I was, it was 2006, I was 25. And then I went back in 2008 and um, was down there for another month or two. Anyway, the episode's out and it's really interesting to talk about like the female perspective and like why she's making the choices she made. I was like, last ditch effort to like give a shit about the religion and do something because like there's an adventure tied to it and she was like her dad is is like a traveling overseer that goes and like whatever monitors and helps out local congregations and elects or like appoints and unappoints elders in that in like a region of like 20 or 50 kingdom halls and um, her family's like deep in like multi-generational anyway she she was like doing stuff to like find the perfect husband or whatever. But what's cool is I also when we shot that in her van, we were both having a camper van thing out in the national park nearby LA Joshua tree and then hanging out with the rock climbers. And um, we shot like some rock climbing of her and her boyfriend and then of our friends and her selling her and her boyfriend selling art out of their van at like a little thing in that it's a very creative artistic town. Lots of, people just buy buy stuff jewelry and stuff anyway i'm excited to like make that episode it might not be the first thing i release this year but it'll be like season three episode one kind of thing and i'm pretty excited to shoot that or edit that and then the other thing that's pretty cool is we were nominated for best documentary feature again second nomination um at a small You're festival welcome. in park city utah called scorpius fest which is um sponsored by metallica it's it's very strange and it's like a very hair metal music festival it's very really feeling um what were we even doing there that's amazing well fun fact fun fact uh (laughs) dave dave mustaine of uh megadeth and uh, briefly of metallica fame grew up as a jehovah's witness yeah what really fun yeah Yeah. so so that's that's probably why they kind of wanted to mock his upbringing i don't know maybe who knows no, that's Did fantastic probably, Metallica probably mock not, but... dave mustaine's upbringing yeah well yeah by like putting an apostate documentary in their film that it's, it's, it's a oh. stretch i'm teasing i'm teasing <laughs> i like i like the different connections yeah it's like it's like jehovah's witness logic like how many hoops you have to jump through to get to the end result 
this was their original goal in setting up their festival. Yeah, right. Fuck Dave Mustaine. <laughs> <laughs> you know what we should do? We should, we should start a film festival and then eventually we'll get a Jehovah's Witness movie. And then, then we'll show them. Then we'll show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a long game. A, a mystery science theater 3000 thing on um, just on <clears throat> stuff from JW Media. So we just, <laughs> yeah. just like the little it. silhouettes of us yeah. mocking what's happening on their, yeah, yeah. On their videos. What's the name of that? That's something uh, flicks something. Oh, else. right, right. It's uh, they came up with a. I know what you're talking about. They came up it's with a, like a spinoff thing from MST3K. Yeah, so they can they can have their. Uh, they're, they can talk shit about movies that are still under thoroughly under copyright because it's just like a thing. And you can, if you happen to Dark Side of Oz, this yeah. with the uh, with the movie. Anyway, I digress. Well, now that there's a, that. the downfall of the Lloyd Evans channel, we can, we, someone has to fill the void of doing commentary on their bullshit media that they produce. <laughs> we can riff we can tracks. Do, I feel it's like riff tracks. Yeah, we That's can riff, riff tracks. tracks. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't just TV static fill about as much void as that? I don't know. Sorry, I'm just talking shit. I, <laughs> I don't know. know. I don't even know I who this find, person is. I find watching Stephen Let talk to be entertaining enough to do a riff tracks on. If you'd I let mean, Stephen talk, and, and you, you start, have to do. and you use his his face and his voice, Stephen I, Lett. I certainly can't. What? <laughs> what, young ones? <laughs> I do. I do. I do not possess enough cartoonishness to sound like Stephen Ladd. There's not enough room up my own anus to fit my entire head like that person. I don't know. Again, talking shit about people. I don't know. And I'm proud of you that you don't watch JW.org media. Um, Yeah. We were so we were nominated for best documentary feature in that festival, and the we didn't win unfortunately. But you know, to get into a festival is like top five percent of films that they got, and then to get nominated is like top one percent, and then to win is like you know beyond that. So we got nominated. We did win that one time. We won, and at a really good festival too. So genre yes. blast. Actually, yes. I decided to wear my genre are you, blast. Are shirt you today. pimping for genre blast yeah. today? Nice. That's the best festival in the world. Genre blast! You give us the rewards. You you reap the war rewards. You we'll get never stop talking called about out it. on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was interesting about that festival and the nomination was that they stream a little piece of the film um, as part of the the award ceremony. So they didn't actually they actually postponed the entire festival till next year, but they wanted to give all the awards this year. So they did this little live Facebook live thing, and um, the scene that they chose was all you, Chad. It was like just your face. Um, the entire thing, which I thought was really strange. There's like so many beautiful moments in the film with like archival footage or like they could have shown like a variety of people or like music would be interesting. Um, but it was like just you talking, which I thought was really interesting, but it was also about, um, yeah. I think that's called the WC Fields effect. You know, it's like, you could be watching something, you know, you could be watching some beautiful shot or something like that, but there's just some dipshit in the corner with color commentary. Like, hey, you see. <laughs> You know, actually, I, I have had a couple people tell me, Chad, that they found you as, as one of the most compelling and magnetic people in the film. I've been telling myself that in the mirror, but it's not translating to the bars or the apps. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we are on a, a, a multi-year challenge to get Chad laid, and that's why you are including him. <laughs> it's uh, the reason it's, I hope to live for another 40 so years. That's so much funnier than, than, when, you, than when, when you coined that joke. It's so much funnier. It's quality, not good. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Anyway, wrangle us and Scott. Uh, okay, those are the big updates. The other thing is I have started, I wanted to launch this year by doing some self-help stuff. So I launched, uh, or I started a therapy session and um, I'm trying out a few different like self-help groups. So I found a therapist who's ex-Mormon, who's worked with a lot of people who've left that church and some also ex jehovahs Witnesses, um, recommended by, this is recommended by another former Jehovah's Witness who wrote a book. Let's see if I have it. I always do this. Rising from the ashes of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't have it right here. Um, it's but, blurred anyhow. Yeah. I was going to pull it out, but anyway, I had, she, she recommended that if you do get therapy, like find someone who's like 
worked with people who've left religion or specialize in that. So I, I did that and I used a really great resource on freedomfromreligion.org called, or linked there, it's called the secular therapy org or psychotherapy.org or psychotherapy project and so that was where i first went and i found someone nearby who specializes in that and she's great um so i'm doing that and i also went to um we had a screening with the freedom.org which is the self-help group for ex-orthodox ex-ultra orthodox and ex-hasidic jewish people that was on saturday so they got to watch the film and then we had like a like a one and a half hour q a which is like the most thoughtful interest like introspective and intellectual like dynamic conversation and then it just and then people then we went to free forum and then we had a conversation until from like 6 to 1 a.m um wow. on the east coast it just kept on going it was really interesting and engaging really really great people so and they want to do it again so hopefully that'll be another thing so if you're interested in that that could be a thing i'm thinking about doing it with um opening it up to like everyone who funded the thing it was seen spark who signed up for that or like paid for that like pre party or whatever watch party kind of thing and then also all the patreon members um and see what that what comes of that to have like a mix of like ex-jewish ex jehovah's witness and others and then um and the other things i did is i joined a recovering from religion exists all over the world so you can like join a zoom call like once a month or once a week depending on your city or in person i tried that on tuesday and then one of my coworkers is in AA, big big proponent of AA, and he brought me to a thing run by the same people as his AA group called Dharma Punks, which is run by a Buddhist organization, um, and it's sort of like a free thing on Mondays for people to gather and build community and under and learn about Buddhism and do what's stillness meditation. Just kidding. It's lame. <laughs> no, I said what's his name? Oh, what's his name? I'm kidding. My, no, yeah. that's what to say. <laughs> and out him. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I can't remember the guy. He wrote a book, kidding, though, buddy. the guy that runs it. Say what? I said, just kidding, buddy. I'm not trying to out <laughs> oh, a, uh, people in recovery. I said, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and in addition to talking about all those topics, I want to get into like what you guys are up to with music. So wherever you want to launch in, um, those are the topics for the day, I think. Well, I find the, the, the recovery topic to be kind of interesting. Um, not just kind of, I mean, I went to therapy myself for a couple of years, um, found it extremely valuable, uh, during specifically during like a really, the first couple of years of like post leaving the religion recovery, I was very, very, very intent on deprogramming myself to the point where I could have a life that had nothing to do with Jehovah's witnesses, um, or ever having been one or really anything at all. And here we are. <laughs> you drag me back in. Sorry. But but in in all seriousness, like the um a lot of the resources you just mentioned, like the Freedom from Religion Foundation and um, Recovery from Religion and secular stuff, there's a lot of really good resources there. And and also um I'm pretty sure I've listened to some sort of podcast from Dharma Punks, because that sounds really familiar. Uh, and also uh, another group that I found super useful and was it's actually uh, a pun on a on a um, on a Kerouac book. It's Dharma Bumps. Go ahead. Dharma yeah, Bumps. Right. I know. Yeah. I, I have that book. <laughs> I love that. I have book. that book. Yeah, I read that yeah. as a witness. Ross and I, one of my mm -hmm. old friends in the religion, we both read that book. Kind of, it was like I read on the road when I was nineteen, and we read Dharma Bombs when we were like twenty five. And it was like the perfect time of life to read that book. I was so like bought into their just kind of way of being in the world. Well, I mean, right. it, there's, I think, I guess all I was trying to say was that there's like a lot of, a lot of that stuff is like some of it you're helping yourself by like, you know, attaching to some good communities and good information and other stuff is a little more direct um, intervention, like a direct in a relationship with a therapist or a psychiatrist or something like that. I think you kind of need all those things. Yeah. I, I, I you got to kind of give yourself like a, uh, like as a witness, you had like a whole community and a whole like, uh, theology and explanation for everything in the world. And then you had like direct relationships with individual people and, uh, I think if you don't sort of fill all those gaps after you leave, then it, it feels off somehow, at least temporarily you need it to help kind of get yourself 
sure. level. And uh, I, I think that that's something we've talked about with the movie is adding something at the end, basically like <clears throat> giving people pointers to right. think things they could resources like that. And I, I think that's worth talking about because I know I used a lot of that stuff myself. I um I confess that by by recovery I meant like literally people with uh, like chemical. I was I was I guess making light of chemical uh, dependency recovery, but um, also a very serious which, thing. Which obviously, is, which is a good yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and but I but like that. Um, I I very much respect that journey, and I also respect the journey of the people who are. Um, I don't know. I've met a lot of people who have. Um, left and they just like they act like everything's fine i'm going to put on this facade of like somebody who hasn't who doesn't have this baggage and it's like you know it doesn't always come off well and you know sometimes people can kind of tell that there's there's like more of a facade there you know just because i mean part of it is we grow up you know you have to put on this facade you have to you know be better than the world be no part of this world and and when you become worldly, you're like, oh, well, I'm just a perfectly good worldly person. And I don't have to focus on any of the baggage that, uh, you know, and um, yeah, I think that it's important to, to address that stuff, even if it gets exhausting, we're all exhausted about it, but it's also cathartic. Catharsis can be exhausting, still important. I think I've learned from the first two sessions first is, is I th- what, well, she didn't say this, but I think what I've, what I've heard or read is that I have something like religious trauma syndrome, which is some form of PTSD. And what she mentioned about PTSD is that, and the trauma you get from that that's different than a memory is that you are, when you experience, when you like think of the moment or like get reminded of the moment, you experience the emotional impact as if it just happened for the first time again. And that that's you're supposed to have a memory which is like a duller form of that moment <clears throat> with a normal memory and ptsd is just this huge hit every time it comes up and so like relaying some of these stories and moments that are like traumatic or important and impactful to me got me super emotional and i was like really struggling to get it out and like kind of crying on on the on the this is a zoom call i'm doing a remote therapy which I thought was really interesting, but also I've never told anyone these moments or like tried to relate the traumatic moments of dealing with my family and the shunning or like conversations that I've had post relieving the religion with family that have ended up being like really important conversations. I didn't know it at the time, but like reflecting back, it's like really impactful. Um, So that's been good to kind of go through that. And then there's this technique called EDMR, which is like, and we haven't started doing that, but she's like, we're sort of like talking through, collecting all like the traumatic issues and moments so that we can do these practices with EDMR. And EDMR is like a, it's a bilateral, what's it called? It's bilateral ASMR, but, but to like a dead mouse beat. <laughs> that sounds great. We should do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I am new, all new in genre. on that. That sounds fantastic. Um, EDM, EMDR, I said it wrong. EMDR is eye movement uh, desensitization responses. Um, and what it has to do is bilateral stimulation. And so like, just like a simple thing with like someone moving their hand and like your eyes track the hand going across the screen or in front of you or a ball, like an image of something moving back and forth, or like you can do, they do like shoulder tapping, like anything that like stimulates your brain on both hemispheres, one after the next, um, or these hand buzzers or any, anything that can like use both hemispheres of the brain and they, no one apparently knows why it works. And I work at a neuroscience company. So I talked to our head head of neuroscience about it. And she said, she knows about it, but doesn't, she's never done a study on it. And she'd be interested if if she thought I had like a good response, she would like think about doing a study on it, which is pretty cool. Um, But basically what the therapist said was like, no one knows why it works, but if you like dwell on the emotional moments and then you like think about those things while you're watching the hand go back and forth, and then you might come up with some new idea or like reflect on it or come up with a new, a, a different uh, I don't know, experience or like come up with a new thing that relates. And, and then you just keep on doing that. And then you rate your like emotion from like one to 10 or, or zero to 10 or like one to seven or whatever scale you come up with, like disturbing to like not zero is not disturbing, 10 is disturbing. 
um, and you start off with like rating it, you do this practice and you rate it, you do it again on some, you know, you get deeper and deeper on your, on your ideas that you're having, your related uh, moments and emotional issues, and then you rate it again after doing the practice. And you're supposed to like dull the effects and like help you like work through it. But I'm, mm-hmm. I haven't started that, but I've watched a video on it recently, just today. It's funny. I had a, a therapist once who forced me to, to like rate where I was at. And I tried to explain to him that, that makes me really anxious and he kept doing it. And I just stopped seeing it because it's like, I don't like rating things. And he's like, well, I just need to get, it's, it's good. It's good. You'll get into it. And I'm like, I'm super willful. This isn't going to happen. So like, as you're saying this, I'm like, wow, catharsis met with just like deep anxiety. <laughs> this sounds awesome. Yeah. I didn't you're actually. Like, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, going to rate being rated on a scale of one to 10 as a one now fuck yeah it. yeah i'm gonna be i'm gonna rate being forced to rate things <laughs> I'm, I'm here because i i i'm i'm not gonna tell you guys what i'm here i had a similar response i was like how do you feel about it at the time zero to ten like um it was pretty benign at the time i didn't realize it was an important conversation at the time we we're reflecting on it being the last conversation later in life made it realize maybe realize it was a really big issue and i didn't know that at the time so and she's like well how does it are you disturbed now and it's like uh, i don't know like i've i have a lot of defenses up like it's a really stupid conversation and it should happen right. shunning's really stupid um you have all, all these layers of, of yeah. that you've put over the memory to protect yourself mm-hmm. and that's that's partially what the what the therapist is you know is there to do is to help you deconstruct those layers yeah. process it and then compartmentalize it so you can live your life but i'm also like not really emotion forward in my life yeah. i'm i'm like very intellectual until i like intellectualize every topic or something right and so like how what emotion do i feel now it's like well i don't feel any emotion now i came to you for that <laughs> well yeah exactly like cerebralizing is a it's, it's kind of it kind of dovetails with the whole like why the typical uh like dude response to sadness is to get angry because uh you know uh, sadness is vulnerability but anger is powerful and actionable whereas you know so it's like the cerebralizing things as opposed to as opposed to allowing yourself to kind of dwell on them emotionally feels a little more actionable feels a little more like you have more control over it yep but you don't. Well, that's <laughs> we are I mean, alone in an uncaring universe. This is great. One of the really str- struggling things for me about like a, a major source of my anger having left the witnesses was the anger at um, having relationships torn away that I was completely powerless to repair. Right? Like if I if I ruin my relationship with somebody because we get in a fight, I can apologize or I can make peace somehow. I can try to reconcile that thing. But if it's dictated by a third party that you two people can't talk to each other anymore, literally nothing you can do. There's like absolutely no option. And I found that like, to your point about actionable, like one of the hugest struggles for me and the thing that sent me to therapy was I can't do anything about these things and I can't stop feeling angry about it. And I can't do anything about that anger. That's it. And so I, I have just to gonna find say, a way. Loop. Yes, yes. I would. Be, I find myself like a, out there mowing the lawn, loop. and so I'd spend the entire time just having imaginary conversations with people I couldn't actually talk to, and just building Fuck up. This, you. Uh, My uh, only crime is being honest with you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and finally, I had to go to a therapist. Literature. My only crime is being honest with you. I'd sit there with a the therapist, being like, "Okay, dude, how do I not go insane in this situation?" That's all I'm asking you. Like, mm-hmm. like, how do I not just spend so much time so angry that I just like off myself in this in this situation? Because it is like legitimately the most frustrating thing in the world is mm. to like know that there is nothing. It's actually better. Like it was easier for me to make peace with people I love who have died because at least I know they're actually gone. Right. And I don't know if you don't go to therapy when you leave the witnesses and you don't feel the need to, I am very jealous. What? And I mean, a lot of people feel like they don't need to go to therapy. 
They just do really dark things. There was a couple more things that she had me do, which were interesting. Um, one was create like a place that's real or imagined where you can go where you're at peace. And so the first place that popped in mind was a place that my family used to go camping. And I think it might not be a best place to create this imaginary blissful place. I actually named it. She wanted me to give it a one word name, which is bliss. I came up with bliss, but it was like a camping place with like, you know, Northern Minnesota, Northern Wisconsin, same kind of thing, but like a really remote place where there's very few tourists. It's a campground, but it's like really off the beaten path. Um, so it's often not full and it has amazing forests. The lake, the water's like copper usually very still there's loons crying in the distance calling in the distance and it would sound like magical and mystical we used to canoe there and the, you walk barefoot on the sandy paths around through the forest and the beach and it's just gorgeous and it smells like pine so i was describing all these different things she had me like she's like all right let's get into one of these like emotional moments let's talk about this feeling you have there now just say the word bliss and imagine that place that you named and so that's like a tool first time i heard about that tool was in fight club Oh yeah. <laughs> Did they use that? A, you, they, well, the, yeah. The 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 narrator does the the main uh, friend or whatever when he tries to go to that place, their cave to like relax. He just slaps him upside the head. It's like this is your burning. This is what's happening right now. Fuck that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so and like the rapport that that you and I have, Scott. Like I just like like if you were here, I would I would pantomime just like. Fuck that you're right here this sucks <laughs> right now this feeling blows ass how does that feel <laughs> sorry i, I digress <laughs> like therapy reality check about, um, yeah right <laughs> um one of the dangers about trying to cerebralize things uh in an effort to kind of hide from the inevitable emotional repercussions is, uh, you know, when you cerebralize things, you indulge your curiosity. And as the three curious dudes, we, uh, uh, three curious ex culties, we all know that um, the the more you more evidence you provide somebody with, the more likely they are to dig their heels. And so, like, <laughs> that's true. Know, these these fe- these feedback loops again with the feedback loops, like these people who get. You, you try to explain to them, you try, you know, your only real sin is, is being honest. The more you try to be honest with them, the more they just see you as evil. And there's just no resolution to be had. And so you have to, hopefully, if you're, if you're um, ready to and mature enough to, you talk to somebody and unpack that. Well, I, I mean, make I- a lot of jokes, but I think anytime somebody says that they have talked to somebody who is, you know, educated in how to help people unpack that stuff. I very much support it. Well, I mean, there's a strong connection to, to other types of recovery, right? I mean, the wisdom to know the difference and the, the strength to, to accept the things that you can't change. I feel like that comes from somewhere. Uh, <laughs> I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, now. and, uh, and, and it's, it's a really valid point because I mean, you, you do have to learn to, um, to just accept that some things are like the way they are and you're not going to do anything about it, but what you can do. And I, 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 I find Buddhism very helpful on that front is you can learn skills to cope with difficult emotions. And like my, 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 uh, I'm not a, I'm not a religious person at this point in my life. I don't have any real supernatural beliefs, but I do think it's very practical. And there are some, therapy strains that sort of synthesize thoughts out of uh out of uh eastern religions where they really talk about the fact that like all things have a wisdom component and have a a, a negative component right and anything that you think is great has a downside and anything that has that is, is terrible probably has a wisdom component as well and learning to develop the ability to um to uh, separate your feelings about those things with the fact that they are what they are and the fact that you can manage your ongoing feelings uh, and you can learn to do that. And you can like that, can you can develop that as a skill, but you can't change the things that actually happen, right? It, that was just jaw dropping for me and is uh, because I was kind of always taught, right? That like you, you know, you have to, well, actually, I was never taught anything on that subject, frankly, because in 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 the Western religious traditions in, in Christianity, they tell you what to do and what not to do, but they absolutely never teach you 
how to handle the feelings that come from those things. Like if you're angry at somebody and you elect not to do something about it, you're internal, you're internalizing that and you're hurting yourself instead, or, you know, it would be helpful if you were taught a healthy coping third option. And in, in, and I find that like learning the third options, learning how to like, not just kill yourself by internalizing your negative feelings and not acting out on them in a negative way is like really hard. And sometimes you need somebody to take you by the hand and sort of be like, you do realize you do have this choice, right? You mm-hmm. don't have self-destruction and hurting other people. You actually have like a middle middle way where you can take something and then you can you can learn to sit with it and then decide how you want to respond to it. That saved my life. I mean, like, I don't think I would have made it 18 years, which by the way, this year, 18 years since I left the witnesses, whoot, holla. Um, You're an adult. I'm an adult. Right. Um, your apostasy is 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 <laughs> it can legally uh, die for your country. I don't know. Yes, <laughs> my I'm gonna send my apostasy into uh, vote this year for me as a second vote. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. No, but seriously, I I really just I can't speak enough to like the fact that like I was at a point in my life like 10, 15 years ago where I, I was just done. I just I. I only knew what I didn't believe. I didn't know what I did. And I certainly didn't know how to respond emotionally to what it felt like to be in that position. I just think it's super, I don't know, whatever techniques you use, as long as they're helping you handle those things. Cause the PTSD, that's not, that's no laughing matter. I mean, like that's just, you don't get help. It never gets better. Mm -hmm. You just, it doesn't. Right. Yeah. I don't know anybody. I know a lot of people who have been ex witnesses for decades or still witnesses who have not gotten help. And they're still witnesses in their head, you know. They've all that been to um, a meeting. Phys- pomi physically out, mentally in, mm-hmm. or the opposite pomi is, five, five. yeah. Or pimi is physically yeah. and mentally in. That's like regular, average Jehovah's Witness or other, you know, cult members or religious people. And then there's phys- uh, mentally in, physically out. So like they're they're just like faking it. They're going. They know they don't believe it, but they're going for social reasons or family reasons or something. Sure. I'm Which I like pomo. those acronyms. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're pomos. I. <laughs> yeah. you mentioned something um about the middle way which is a buddhist term and in our talk the talk on monday the talk that's funny the uh it was basically like going to church actually it was like a guy at a podium you know speaking about buddhism and we're all listening in the audience on like relatively uncomfortable chairs um oh wow that does sound familiar <laughs> with like, like the you know, dirty, to run dirty carpet yeah yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> But they, he talked about how with, we with Western Christian, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> <laughs> with, with Western or Christian ideas, you have the concept of sin, which is like the world, we're going to die and there's all these issues, but like your form of suffering is your own problem. Like you're the cause of it through sin and, and that you're broken and you need something because you were born in this like broken way. And, as, as the, and you as should the feel late, guilty. As yeah. the okay. late great uh, uh, Saint Christopher Hitchens said, we are uh, created broken and commanded to be well. Indeed. Oh, yeah. to, uh, and the difference. Hitch. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to go Alan peace. Watts on me, but Hitch was peace, Hitch, sorry. Uh, but the, the, the opposite of that, or not the opposite, but like the Buddhist way of thinking about that is that they, they don't have a concept for sin. There is just suffering and like contentment and you're you're you may be doing having both at the same time usually we're we oscillate between the two where we are all either like we're all faced with different challenges and sometimes it sucks and it has nothing to do with you it's just like the human condition which is i think an incredibly far superior and more healthy way to understand the world and your place in it to realize that to, to not blame yourself or feel guilt for something that's out of your control to just understand that it is out of your control and then okay how are we going to handle that thing if with talents we are Fuck. endowed Seriously. there's no reason there to be proud the entire intermission i was just like god damn you god ah. damn you ryan sutter <laughs> can't get this song out of my head oh, <laughs> <Ryan Sutter. laughs> 
the yes, curse of being musicians for you too is that <laughs> like, melodies are permanently in your brain. Uh, yes, do yes. you know well, how I many times that, I've thought about man. reclaiming? I'd love to reclaim the space in my brain that's wasted on dumb songs. I thought you were talking about starting a side project where we just like uh, shit on uh, Kingdom Melodies by writing uh, subversive. You know. <laughs> Well, I okay. did I, I, to plug my to plug my whole thing. Oh God, you guys know what I actually look like. This is terrible. Um, to plug my own band, I actually named a song "Stay Away, Stand Firm, and Grow Mighty." It's a great song. Uh, Put it in the movie. Yeah, that is on movie. the album "Sleepy Wood Dojo" by yeah. Ghost Army. Yeah. It's fucking great. You should get it. It's not so great bad. shit. I'm gonna yeah. uh, gotta go. put my filter on my sepia filter. Yeah, guys, come go. on, get with it. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I'm on it. You know what? I I was I was distracted by the dulcet ch- tones of Chad's voice. There we so. go. <laughs> um, to to complete my thought, go to Bandcamp. Uh, golden. Ghostarmy.bandcamp.com and buy a copy of Sleepy Wood Dojo. You will not regret it. Ryan, like the universe, is one of my biggest fans. This um, is true. <laughs> You were talking before um, the small break there about the music break yeah. for by one of our sponsors, JW.org. <laughs> <laughs> FJW. <laughs> XJW. I'm sure XJW.org is out there. And oh, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, yeah, they probably have all the dish on whatever nerdy apostate YouTubers currently going <laughs> through fucking scandal cares. Um <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did I let my slip show there for a second? Um, you were talking about the golden uh, Western, rule. Western, yep, uh, the the golden uh, rule. We- yeah, Western philosophy, golden rule. Uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, the Eastern philosophy, golden rule, is um, do unto others as you think they would have done unto them. So it's, the the Western, it always struck me as interesting. And also somebody told me this, I could be making this shit up, but it, it just, it's just, it's an interesting thought that like the golden rule still kind of invokes your, like not to be petty or anything, but like a certain amount of like selfishness. I'm going to treat you how I want to be treated. Well, fuck that dude. Treat somebody how you think they want to be treated, you know, because that, 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 forces you to engage empathy as opposed to like, well, you know, if I deserve it, they might too. Like, Yeah, I mean, you can't be like, (laughs) hey, you know, I like barbecue ribs and therefore I'm going to give somebody barbecue ribs and they're like, yeah, but I'm a vegan. And you're like, yeah, but I would want barbecue ribs. So you get them. You need to have, you have to consider what other people actually want. I mean, it's nice not to do things that they, you know, I, there's even a, there's another version of it. I think it's the the silver rule or something. It's even a lighter version that's basically like don't do unto others what you wouldn't want done to you. Sure. And yeah, that's well, that's even worse. Like I wouldn't want to be punched in the face, so I won't punch you in the face. But I'm not going to do something I think you would want. I'm just going to refrain from negative action towards <laughs> you. I I once had somebody uh, to talk about casting your pearls before swine. Uh, thank you, Paul. That it goes well. Um, <laughs> I once, had somebody who thought, <laughs> I once had somebody uh, tell me uh, during a, a, a somewhat friendly debate at work that uh, he's like, it's like the golden rule, do unto others before they do unto you. And I laughed and he goes, like, don't. I'm like, what? He goes, don't laugh at scripture. And I'm like, whoa, wow, buddy. <laughs> really? Oh, man. I was just, I was so, it was this beautiful like heady cocktail of just confusion (laughs) pity um frustration with myself for not having picked up on this way before this point amazing (laughs) Uh, love scripture i take Uh, that shit seriously on new year's i was with a bunch of my la friends some of you met in minneapolis when we visited but um i made a bible joke which i can't remember at the moment but i like i quoted something Never underestimate the power of stupid people in large, <laughs> in large groups. groups. <laughs> capital building. It, nice. it has a capital building, but uh, it is actually topical for this. Sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> but I, I made this Bible joke and my young, the youngest one there is 21. She, we've been her like college experience through the pandemic, which has been really fun. Um, I gave her tons of shit, but she's like, nobody gets your Bible jokes. And then, I, <laughs> and then this, this new woman in our group 
she's like, oh, I know the Bible because I'm Catholic, which made me yes. laugh immediately. I was like, I haven't met a Catholic who read the Bible. <laughs> I once had a, a, a really a, a gentleman, an older gentleman that I, I worked with who talked, um, he was very Catholic, but he's kind of like weirdly devout. And I asked him like, well, you know, let's spar some, I think it was even a witness back then. And um, he goes, no, that's not my job. I'm the laity. Like, that's not, my uh, job yeah. is, my the job Pope is reads to, the Bible. yes, exactly. The scholars read the Bible. They disseminate it to me. Mm. And it's like, wow, one of the oldest, you know, uh, the, uh, current Christian religions. It's, it's very little wonder that people keep fucking forming these, these psychotic uh, high control offshoots right. of like, oh, we just kind of, you know, you do the thinking and I'll, uh, I'll just listen, you know. Well, it's a lot easier, you know. It. It's a lot easier. Just show up, have a cracker I mean, and your wine, and go home. It's great. It's a good time. For the for the incurious, I suppose. But this fellow seemed kind of curious. But I digress. Um, so, uh, just to kind of um, bring us back. So you were talking about the uh, influences of Buddhist philosophy on your personal journey, right, Scott? That's the thing. I, I, I rationalize <laughs> interrupting and making stupid jokes all the time because yeah. I like put a pin in what people are talking about and bring them back. And then I don't feel it like a total piece to, of that's shit. True. Oh, yeah. I, that's true. I guess there is something more I can say on that, which was um, when I was in Vietnam, one of my, this photographer, a friend from Denmark, um, he's sort of like a natural philosopher. And he, he started going to the stillness meditation thing there with Master Hung. And so I started going and they're like, don't eat meat be vegetarian, whatever. Yeah, that's the same thing. Um, don't drink caffeine, no alcohol, wake up at the ass crack of dawn and get here by 7 a.m. or whatever. And so I started trying to do all those things and practice. I learned how to do stillness meditation from this guy. And he had like translators, people that spoke English to translate his philosophy in Eastern. I think he's like part Taoist, but it's like a fusion there. It's quite a fusion in the culture. Um, but I learned to meditate there. And it's like the noisiest, dirtiest, most distracting place on earth. Is like motorbikes going by, making noise all day, all night. There's jackhammers in the building next door. There's babies crying. There's dogs barking. There's ho horns honking. It's just, but all that stuff is actually sensory input that you can actually pay attention to. Kind of like focusing on the breath, come back to the breath. That's like great if you're like in a quiet place and there's nothing going on. There's like at least a thing to focus on to like keep your attention present. Um, and um, in this, in Dharma Punks, we had like a 15 minute little meditation where it was mostly silent. The guy who's running it had a few things to say to kind of like make sure you're like staying on focus much like doing a, a guided meditation but he mostly didn't guide anyway like and of course you get lost in thought but it's all about like once you recognize that you're lost in thought recognize the thought that you're lost in thought and like be back in present and and it was interesting it's it's a kind of a, I, I value it people have asked me how I felt about my first Buddhist experience and I was happy to say that I've like I'm quite an advocate for like the waking up podcast it's like a not the podcast but like the waking up app they have like daily meditations on there. I used to use it a lot. Um, it's it's a really valuable tool, I think, to be able to, I mean, there's there's a lot that you can gain from having control of your mind and your thoughts. The monkey brain is always chattering and that's not necessarily you. People like go on murder sprees because they listen to that voice, you know? Like, don't listen to that voice. Like be aware of what it's saying and that you aren't that thing. It's also I the, the voice that-, that Put that the guy. guns away. Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> it's also the voice that makes me interject little little quips all the time and it's, it's the only part of uh, <laughs> it was gonna get dark i was like it's also the only part of me that anyone else likes i'm just kidding <laughs> i i, I, I <laughs> substitute for charm <laughs> i i've been doing um meditation practice for longer than i realized i've been doing it like for me my first um encounter with buddhism was actually when i was about 15 um, I read a book, uh, called writing down the bones by, uh, an author named Natalie Goldberg. And she wrote about writing as a Buddhist spiritual practice. And I probably shouldn't have read this book because she was like a lesbian Buddhist and atheist and stuff. Now you are a lesbian Buddhist. Now I'm a lesbian Buddhist <laughs> atheist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, but I read the book and I 
Aren't we of course, as a witness, I did my proper filtering to be like, well, I mean, she's going to die in Armageddon, but this seems practical. <laughs> so I did the thing. I learned to do the thing, which was a, a, a form of Buddhist meditation built around writing, um, because the goal was to set a timer for like 15 minutes and be like, it doesn't matter what happens, but the pen keeps moving. So you're you're in this you're in this flow state for 15 minutes and you're not trying to write something or trying not to write something. You're just being in a practice state. I did that for years before I had any re realization that that was actually a form of like a, almost like a walking meditation or a sitting meditation or something like that, where they were just adapting it. I've, I mean, I remember reading once Thich Nhat Hanh being like, washing the dishes can be a meditation if you're doing it the right way. And, and, I, I didn't realize for a long, long time that that's what I was doing. But I, when I learned that that was useful, then I started trying other kinds of meditation. I started doing sit meditation and walking meditation. And, you know, the thing where you do, I don't know if you've ever done the thing where you're doing the breath, but you're just supposed to count how many up to 10 and then start at one again. And then it's almost impossible to get to 10 before you, you lose track. It's crazy how hard that is. Like, it's really, really hard. You'll be breathing and you'll be like, one okay this is easy two okay cat you know and then like what was i on was it three or was i on two okay no i was that was two and then but anyways like i've learned all these little different um focus technologies right um through different uh buddhist things and it's funny how like i a lot of times i learned some of these things i didn't even realize where they were coming from i didn't even know they were coming from buddhism but then eventually i met Natalie Goldberg and uh, I uh, sent her an email and told her my whole story and was like, yeah, I, when I left the Jehovah's Witnesses after, you know, all these years, uh, I suddenly recognized that all of that writing practice that I learned from you when I was 15 was like what I had been doing to condition my mind for all these years. And then I wound up opening my eyes and I saw the rest of Buddhism and then I started doing Buddhist meditation and wow, this is really useful. Like, I don't know if I'm a Buddhist or not, but this is great. And she wrote back and she was like, that's amazing. That is so cool. I've been sharing your story with other people and all this. And then she came and she went to the clouds and water Zen center in St. Paul. And I went there and met her and she was just a sweetheart. So Very it was cool. kind of like a, like a major, I was just like, it was just a hero worship thing. It was just like, oh my God, I met Natalie Goldberg and she remembered my email and it was so great. Um, so therefore you should meditate. And, and as, a Buddhist, <laughs> as a Buddhist, she immediately chastised you for uh, uh, putting her on a pedestal. Yeah. <laughs> That's my one takeaway. And my other takeaway is that Natalie Goldberg invented journaling. I think that's, is that what you're saying? Yeah, she did. She was the first person to ever write a journal by setting a timer to write it it's wonderful i love it actually I, um, writing down the bones though is a really good book that you should read while you listen to sleepy wood Go dojo by ghost army <laughs> I, love, I love you well it's funny <laughs> it's funny you say that because i was about to blow some sunshine up the up your skirt as well um i i think i um there you are in a lot of ways i feel like i was able to fast track uh, a, a lot of these these things, these kind of like hangups that people who leave the, the religion get stuck on um, because uh, my, my big bro, Ryan, you know, the, the one who, who got me interested in, 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 you know, making music and, and sharing it with friends as an actual thing to do, as opposed to like, I wish I could, um, you know, I also, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're saying is stuff that you and I have been talking about for years. And oh, yeah. I've just had, I've had such an, um, I've had such a, what's it, an advantage or whatever, just having somebody who's, who was, uh, you know, before me uh, leaving, much more well read than I am. And just said, like, hey, actually read this, do this. What do you think of that? And it's like, I think I'm fast tracking this whole uh, <laughs> recovery from my <high> control <laughs> group thing. <laughs> This is fair, but thank you. Because life is short you. and you got to spend your time uh, doing other stuff. And I love you too. Right. And I'm petting a dog right now. If you're wondering what I'm doing off camera here, just. 
I've learned not to ask. <laughs> it's a different dog every like 20 seconds. They've all been walking in and taking the spot and being like, okay, it's my turn. I guess um, I want to um, segue over to what you're up to with music. So we had our film, yeah. we had our film festival screening. That was the biggest deal of the year for us in Minneapolis in November, mid-November. And um, we were going to have a concert, which got canceled due to COVID, of course. Um, what has come of that? Where are you guys at? Little update. Um, I'd like to go first because I probably have far less, uh, far less, and far less interesting. So if Ryan goes first, I'm going to be like, um, I talked to my band, and 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 they're cool. If we can get another drummer and find a great <laughs> venue, basically. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, basically, it's kind of uh, um, as more things uh do or do not fall in line you know it's 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 a, it's a we, we shall see um i think it can be it can happen if there's momentum if there's not momentum um like anything i mean <laughs> do you know that water's wet it's like <laughs> if there's momentum then yeah i'm sure it'll it'll uh it'll come through i was yeah so bummed about book a little mini tour around minnesota Around the cities, beautiful. Get five or ten venues for a high TV. I one of the things I love. Oh, you're breaking up, Chad. Yeah, I lost you. I guess one of the things he loves. Okay. It's just respect. Hey, it's respectful. Of. <laughs> there we go. I'm back. Apparently, yeah. my internet is unstable. Which, what's that supposed to mean? Um, what was I gonna say? High TV tour. You were gonna promise high TV was going on a multi state. Oh, tour. yeah, no, I, I was talking about how uh, how Scott's uh, you know, it's like, well, it, it's possible we might have it, and it's like, well, let's think really big now, then you know, <laughs> it's like it, it's possible. Well, why do one show when you could have another album, right? <laughs> why, you know, yeah, why play, why write a song when you can write every song ever yeah <laughs> well you know there's nothing stopping you chad from making recordings my own music of yes. music I'm just saying yes it's true and it, yeah yeah that's that's um, i mean unless there is something stopping you gotta you gotta sleep with dojo follow-up project um yeah kicking around nothing to to really uh, uh speak of at this point but um yeah what was that solo stuff do you have a name for that stuff that was in the movie of you playing in the living room some of those um, loop tracks you're doing <clears throat> self-indulgent wankery uh <laughs> no I, I i don't have a necessarily a, 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 a label for that yet but i have been writing so we'll see like that's why I wanted to go first because like Ryan again is a is a, is a it likes concise Scott, things is a, to say is a person <laughs> is a person who has like you know like bigger ideas and 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 more grandiose scope and I'm always like hedging my bets uh, for fear of being disappointing disappointed or disappointing so um, yeah I'm 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 writing thank you for asking and uh, uh, stay tuned uh huh okay okay. No, K is, uh, K is in, uh, <laughs> uh, is in Spanish K. Like what? Um, yeah, so Awkward Bodies and I uh, had, of course, worked up a whole bunch of music to play in November of my stuff. Um, but before we did that, we had been working on some material. <laughs> that's, that's the band name, by the way, that he's not just shitting on. Yes, yes, yes. No, Awkward Bodies is, is the band that I have proudly uh performed with for the last oh gosh like three years now and uh um, band very fun yeah they're 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 fucking great i was a fan of theirs before i got to join um we had a bunch of material that was sort of in development before we started pivoting over to my stuff for that show and so um after the show we uh we started uh tracking so we've got I don't know about, I want to say five songs, maybe um, at various stages of uh, recording completion. We've been 
We've been hitting the studio on average weekly um, to record stuff. We've recorded some of mine. We've recorded uh, one. And when I say five, I'm including a couple that we actually tracked and recorded before the uh, November that were not ever like properly released. Like we have a couple of songs that we recorded and, and we, we sort of threw them out on YouTube or shared them on a thing, but we never like released them on an album. So there's an Awkward Bodies album in serious traction development at this point where there's probably, you know, going to be a dozen, 13 songs, something like that. And it sounds really fucking great so far. I got to admit, I'm absolutely loving it. And um, we're having a lot of fun. And, uh, and we're, like I said, we're probably, we're pretty much hitting a different song every week right now. And we're like doing the thing where we all get together and we record as much crap as we can in two or three hours. And then for the next four or five days, we're throwing tracks on at home and making mixes and stuff. So that one's really actually get, it's really going. So there's definitely going to be an awkward bodies record, uh, pretty soon here. And then I'm also finally getting serious about tracking a solo thing that, um, I've been, composing in dribs and drabs for like five years and i am hopeful to have it tracked this month because it's rpm challenge and that's a good excuse um i don't know when it would actually get out the door but um i have actively been on the nights i'm not tracking with awkward bodies i'm actively tracking in the basement here so there's a lot of music under development right now coming from casa de sutter here <laughs> And uh, we'll see how it turns out. I'm telling you, though, so far, I'm very happy about what the Awkward Body stuff is turning out like and my solo stuff. Not as stoked yet, but I have, you know, I'm just getting my legs back under me. I, this is like recording totally on your own is kind of a shit experience like you go in there and you're all like oh it's gonna be great i got this thing i'm gonna do this thing i'm really excited and then you get down and you're like okay do i have to like play to a fucking metronome first so i can do the drums later or should i do the guitar first and then do the thing or should i like skip that all together and just like go like play xbox there's always one fucking thing <laughs> there's always one fucking thing that steals you like i'm gonna go to the music room and then you're like God, I just cannot nail this thing. And it's just like, all right, all the air is let out of the balloon. Yeah. And then 11 hours later, you've literally done nothing but right. update, like run the update installers on all your plugins. On all the plugins that you haven't, <laughs> you haven't used for like four years. Uh, three things uh, uh, for anybody listening, RPM Challenge Record Production Month. It's uh, rpmchallenge.com. And you can basically, it'll answer your questions about that. It's a, uh, 10 songs or 35 minutes of music uh, that you record during the month of February. Um, you can write songs previous to it uh, if you want to, but you're not supposed to record one note. And it's just a, a, a you know, creativity challenge. Um, you don't win anything for doing it, but it's you, super it's nice. Us. You can upload things. Uh, um, you can upload things to the, the website and you can get, you know, solicit uh, feedback and whatnot. So it's kind of cool. It's, a, it's just a, um, you know, it's creativity exercise. Uh, two, uh, it's really cool to hear that you're recording again because you have joked off and on over the last, you know, five to 10 years um, about just kind of like, eh, I'm just giving, I'm gonna give up, uh, you know, I'm, I'm giving up recording as decadent, you know, so like to hear you go like, I'm, I'm <laughs> fucking with some tunes. Like that's like, oh, you know, my one of my many muses uh, in my life hasn't, uh, hasn't hung up the, uh, the creativity hat as far as that's concerned yet and there's uh, a third thing oh i love the idea that um a record is in traction like literally you're taking the, the the record and you're yanking it out so you can set the bone and make it right accurate yeah. uh-huh that is actually what it what it means in this case Ryan, I, I waited until you're done to, to interject are you proud of me i'm so proud chad <laughs> i'm so proud and i hope you like my record when there is a record it's been a while. Do you know my last like full length thing was 10 years ago? Hmm. Which one was I did that? an I did an EP in 2014, so that's like 8 years ago, but my last full length was Blood and Scotch Valentine in 2012. Wow. So, it's been a while. I'm a little overdue. Yeah. Yeah. We released Blood and Scotch Valentine on Valentine's Day. So next Wednesday, <laughs> next Tuesday. No, two Tuesdays. 
Uh, I could yeah, I could re-release Blood and Scotch Valentine for its 10 year anniversary edition. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love Blood and Scotch Valentine. It's my favorite thing I've ever done. Um, and I can't believe it's 10 years ago now because it feels like it was like, oh, that was last year's RPM, right? No. Nope. Right. 